In today's video, I'm going to beat Pokemon Fire Red with only a Mew. And while I do it, I'm going to answer your questions because this is a special video because we have reached 50,000 subscribers. Thank you so much. It means the world to me. Before I get into the questions, I first want to set up the run. So let's talk about the rules, which are I can only use my starter in battle, no items in battle except held items. I'm not allowed to use any glitches, exploits, or RNG manipulation. And I'm also not allowed to use the double team TM until my Pokemon is level 100. So now let's talk about Mew. It has 100 in all of its base stats, it has a medium slow growth rate which is really great for the early game, and then its move pool is like gigantic. I actually couldn't fit all of the moves that it learns here because it also gets all of the tutor moves with uh, the exception of the three that are only for starter Pokemon. Anyways, I left all the other ones off just for convenience. And the reason that Mew's move pool is so expansive is the fact that it learns every single TM move. So yeah, this thing is not lacking in type diversity. Now in generation three, the move's type determines which type of damage it deals, either physical or special. And in this case, since Mew has the same type attack bonus with only psychic type moves, I think that boosting its special attack and lowering its physical attack is probably Probably the best way to go, so today I chose a modest nature. When deciding which starter Pokemon I should replace with the Universal Pokemon Randomizer, I had to check which rival team would actually be the best against Mew, and in the end I decided to face the rival's team when he chooses Squirtle. This is because both Arcanine and Blastoise know the move Bite, which is super effective, and Executor, which is the grass type stand-in, is not weak to psychic type moves. In this case it actually resists them because it also has the psychic type. If I had say face the Charizard team, then his ace would wouldn't have a move that is super effective, and if I had faced the Venusaur team then my moves would be super effective against his ace. Now unfortunately for Mew, it doesn't start the game off with a particularly good move set. It just gets Pound, which is a 40 base power normal move. At least it has 100% accuracy. In this case it takes me 4 turns to knock the Squirtle out, but Mew hardly took any damage, so that's really a reflection of how good its stats are. However, I am going to have to figure out how to defeat Brock, because Mew learns Transform at level 10, and then Mega Punch at level 20. Both moves which are not particularly good against his Rock types. However, since I already defeated him in Generation 1 with a Mew in the past, I have an idea about how I can defeat him today. But before that, I'm going to start off by answering the frequently asked questions. So I always get asked the question, will you ever play X game? Like, will you play Platinum or Black and White 2? What about X and Y? Maybe the modern games, Scarlet and Violet? And the answer is yes, eventually. I add new games to the channel every year on December 25th, so stay tuned next year for the next game that is coming. Because of how long it takes me to learn each new game and all of the time that it takes to like program my overlay and all of the other software components, I can only expand into one new game per year, so yeah, I am aiming for Pokemon Platinum next year, and I'm also hoping to start up some other forms of content which will hopefully allow me to play the other games before that time. And that leads me to the next frequently asked question, which is, will you ever do Nuzlocke's again? Yes. Actually, in early 2022, I wanted to start a Nuzlocke series and play a Nuzlocke every month for the entire year. However, this series never got started up because I was taking so much time to produce my other videos. I'm hoping that in the near future, I'm going to be able to start releasing this series, but I have to develop my overlay for it first, and that's really the thing that's holding me back from just starting to release those videos. Anyways, I am working on it now, so hopefully in the near future, Nuzlocke's will start coming to the channel. Now, if you're not a fan of Nuzlocke's and you're like, no, this means less challenge content. It actually doesn't because I plan to release the Nuzlocke's in addition to my regular solo challenge content. So following this theme of alternative types of content, I always get asked if I'll play ROM hacks on the channel, and I do intend to. However, I'm not sure if I'll say make like a Pokemon Blue Kaizo series. I might just do one playthrough of that game and upload it as a single video. I'm not in a rush to start playing ROM hacks, so don't hold your breath if you're really excited for these videos. Right now, I'm very focused on my solo challenge series and then starting up my Nuzlocke series. I also get asked if I'll ever play any non-main series games on the channel, like Stadium, Pokemon Snap, something like that. At the current time, I don't see myself making any videos on non-main series games. Like, my obsession for the Pokemon series is like almost exclusively wrapped up in the main series games. As a kid, I wasn't allowed to watch the anime, and I didn't have a console, so I never played games like Pokemon Stadium. 
It might be fun for me to make a one-off video where I do a first playthrough attempt of one of those games, but that's really the only way I could see myself playing those games on the channel. Okay, so I have two more frequently asked questions. The first one is, will I ever play X game with Y Pokemon? And the answer is most likely yes, or I would at least consider it. My current plans are to play through every Generation 1 game with all 151 Pokemon, and then I also intend to play through the Generation 2 games with almost every Pokemon, probably every Pokemon, like it'll, it'll end up that way. When we start getting into Generation 3 and later, there are so many Pokemon that I could probably make YouTube videos until the end of my life and we would never run out of videos to make. So for games like Generation 3, currently I'm thinking that I'm going to play through the games with all Pokemon that were introduced in that generation. And I'll obviously try to do more playthroughs, but like time is limited and I just don't know if I can beat Pokemon Emerald with like, I think it's 386 Pokemon. <laughs> Anyways, let's finish off these frequently asked questions. So what time type is Venomoth. And of course, it's a bug dark type. Alright, so now let's get back to the playthrough. I arrive at Brock at level 13, this is over a damage rounding threshold, and now Mew has both Pound and Transform. Strangely enough, I think that I'm going to be able to defeat him with these moves. First up, he sends in Geodude, it's level 12, and I'm hoping that Pound is going to be enough to take it out. I'm not doing very much damage, but at least I'm doing more than one every turn. Also, because Mew's a mythical Pokemon, it has very good stats, so I'm not taking very much damage every time the Geodude uses Defense Curl. I pound it all the way down to low red health, and then at the very last moment, I use Transform to turn into Geodude myself. Now, here's an interesting thing about Transform, which I didn't know at the time, which is when you use it, you actually steal the opponent's stats, and that includes their stage modifier. So you can see here that now I have plus six defense. I didn't look down at this part of my overlay when I was playing, so I tried to use defense curl, and I was like, wait, why won't my defense go any higher? Anyways, after two wasted turns, I figured out that, yeah, I should just be using Tackle. I knock the Geodude out, and then Onyx comes in next. Unfortunately, my Tackle isn't doing very much damage. Luckily, when you use Transform, you only get 5 PP with each of the moves that you copy. It's, like, really unfair. I don't know why they designed this move this way. Anyways, that means I can deplete all of Defense Curl and eventually use Struggle. However, because my health is so low, I'm not going to be able to knock the Onyx out, and so that leads to my first reset. So let's try a different approach to this fight now. If I knock the Geodude out using Pound exclusively, then when the Onyx comes out, I can use Transform. This gives me its high defense stat, as well as an additional move, which is Rock Tomb. By the way, it doesn't show up on my overlay, I have no idea why. <laughs> Anyways, I was hoping that using Bind in combination with Rock Tomb would be enough to finish the Onyx off, but once again, I just don't have quite enough health and it takes me down. Alright, so while I think this is theoretically possible to defeat Brock at level 13, it just makes more sense to go and train. I can defeat the junior trainer in Brock's gym. By the way, this fight did not go well for me. I transformed into the Geodude, and then by the time the Sand True comes out, I have such low health. I do end up taking the victory, but it got very close. After that, I head back into the wild, defeat some more Pokemon, and level Mew up to level 15. Okay, so this is over another damage rounding threshold, let's try Brock again. I did lose to Brock here on my first attempt because I transformed into Geodude. That still just doesn't make any sense, I'm not sure why I tried it. However, in my fourth fight against Brock, I transform into Onyx, which is the correct move. And then, using Bide and Rock Tomb together, I am doing a lot of damage. Plus, I have more health at the higher level. And because of this, after a long fight, I finally take the Onyx out and earn myself the first badge. With it comes a 10% boost to my attack stat, and that is really nice because my only attacking move is still only Pound, but that is going to change very soon. Because in Mount Moon, Mew is going to get access to a lot more moves. First, just inside the entrance is the TM for Bullet Seed, which is a grass type move, and this is going to be very useful against Pokemon that are rock ground types. Also, I teach Mew Rock Tomb, which against neutral targets is going to be more powerful than Pound. Plus, it has the added benefit of lowering speed and being able to knock out the wild Zubat in Mount Moon. Yes, I do know that I can buy repels in Pewter City now, but when I filmed this video, I did not know that. <laughs> A little bit further into the cave, I can head down these two ladders and pick up the TM for Thief. A lot of you mentioned in the comments on my Butterfree video that I really should have used this move against Misty's Starmie. And yeah, that is a great strategy to use with any Pokemon that can learn this 
move. And here I'm going to explain why I chose to do a Mew playthrough of Fire Red rather than doing another mythical legendary Pokemon like Celebi or Jirachi. So I wanted to do a playthrough with Mew so that I could figure out which TMs work the best against specific major battles. After all, Mew can learn every TM, so this is sort of a way for me to fast track my learning of these new games. Alright, so with Thief on my moveset, now let's continue on with the Q&A. Eric19Borgnia asks, how do you feel about the growth of your channel and the improvement of your content over the last year? So to answer this question, I want to go back in time two years. When I first added my Pokemon's current moveset to my overlay, which was actually in my Mew video in Pokemon Yellow, I had the dream that one day it would be possible to play a live playthrough on stream and show the audience everything that I would show them in a regular produced video. However, at that time, I didn't think that it would be possible to do any of this. After all, to update my moveset back then, I had to pause the game, update an Excel spreadsheet, and then resume the game. I would forget this all the time, so my moveset was always always incorrect, and uh, fixing that in post, like, sometimes we'd miss it, it was just so frustrating. Okay, so fast forward to a year ago in January, and I still didn't know that accessing the game's RAM in real time was a possibility. However, in February of last year, I found the tool Gamehook, which was sort of not being developed anymore, and the project was eventually revived. Then I learned some coding. Uh, by the way, I just like looked up YouTube videos and talked to the developer of Gamehook. That's all I did. I didn't do any official like uh, coding courses or anything like that. And now I have an overlay that shows all of this stuff in real time, and it can basically do what I dreamt of two years ago. So I am so happy with the progress that I have made behind the scenes to improve the quality of these videos by developing new tools. I'm also really excited to keep improving things because I have way more ideas than I have time to implement. So yeah, uh, new stuff coming very soon. Mr. Protein5225 asks, Hey Scott, my question is, had you ever expected the channel to blow up this much? And are you planning to redo your old playthroughs to update the rankings? Well, no, I did not expect my channel to blow up this much. Honestly, I just sat down one day and I was like, I want to make a video that's like a J-Rose or Madrai Bread video, only because I wanted to learn video editing. I never actually intended for anyone to watch the videos. So it was just a really happy surprise when people started watching them and I was able to start making money making the videos, because now I can play Pokemon as my job, and yeah. That is absolutely incredible. To answer the second half of your question, yes, I am planning to redo very old playthroughs. I'll do them as streams, and then I'll just put them into the ranking, so yeah. I don't want to do like multiple fully produced videos on the same Pokemon. That just feels like very off and weird. Like, way too much effort for me, and also uh, like, why would you want to watch like three videos on the same Pokemon? So to answer another question, which was asked by Matthew Elliott, 3830, he asks, how does it feel to have achieved this lifestyle as your job? Well, Matt, it feels incredible. And all of you are incredible for supporting me because with patrons and YouTube members combined, we almost have 400 people supporting the channel now. So thank you all so much for making this a reality. So now let's get back to the playthrough. If you look at my moveset, you can see that I have Mega Punch in the place of Pound. This is because just outside of Mount Moon, there is a move tutor. That's how I taught Mew this move. Now examining the rest of my moveset, it is very clear that I should be able to defeat Misty now. I have super effective damage against all of her Pokemon in the form of Bullet Seed. Thief is super effective against the Starmie, and uh, Mega Punch is quite powerful if it doesn't miss. She leads with Staryu, I go for Bullet Seed, she saves it with the Super Potion, and then I knock it out over the next two turns. She sends in Starmie, it outspeeds using Water Pulse, which doesn't do very much. Thief does almost half. It hits again, confusing Mew this time, which is annoying, but I still move, take the Starmie down to red health, and then because Misty used her healing item, I move on the next turn and take Starmie out. So that was an easy second badge. I pick up the rare candy in someone's backyard. Like, why is it just here? It doesn't make any sense that like candies would just be like strewn around the region and that like picking them up and feeding them to your Pokemon would be a good thing. Like, have you ever found food in a public place and been like, hey, that's a really valuable thing. I just like want to pick that up and take it with me. No, no. <laughs> Every time you see food in public, you're like, disgusting. I do not want to touch that. Up next is the rival fight on Nugget Bridge. Now I'd say this fight is significantly harder in Fire Red because he leads with Pidgeotto. And yes, it does have Sand Attack. However, it just uses Quick Attack. I miss Rock Tomb, which is unfortunate. On the next turn, it does hit. 
but it doesn't get the knockout. So as a result, Mew's accuracy is lowered by one stage before I finally finish it off. Next, the rival sends in Rattata. I go for Thief, it takes it to red health. The rat uses Tackle, doing very little, and then I finish it off on the next turn. He sends in Squirtle next, but I have Bullet Seed, so I'm able to take it out over two turns, and all that remains is the Abra. It has no attacking moves, so I easily finish it off. And with that, I'm moving on to the rest of this long route. All right, so while I complete it, let's do some more questions. Zachary Essie 5904 asks, Do you like that there are more story elements being put into Pokemon games, or do you prefer what the older games did? Well, honestly, I prefer what Generation 1 did, which is that the story is not very intrusive on the player. You just sort of engage with it when you want to. And other than that, the game almost never stops you from progressing or exploring. And yes, sometimes the game does stop you, like it did just previously where the rival ambushes you on Nugget Bridge. However, in those cases, it's always to challenge the player with a battle or something like that. When I think about modern Pokemon games, my mind is always drawn to Sun and Moon and how it feels like every time you turn the corner, the game just like stops you, explains something to you, shows you a new mechanic, and then delivers like five pages of dialogue, which could be summed up with a single sentence or just like the player could have figured out the mechanics themselves. So thinking about those games, I always wonder how I'm going to play them on the channel because I cannot imagine doing multiple playthroughs when you have to just like learn how to ride Tauros over and over and over again. I think the biggest downside to this approach that Game Freak has been taking in recent times is just that it makes the games less replayable. And honestly, that's the charm that the early Pokemon games have. They are just infinitely replayable. And yes, probably the biggest factor that makes them replayable is emulators with speed boost. I cannot imagine playing these games at one time speed now. So yes, in short, I much prefer the way that the older games handled the plot elements. I am really hoping that Game Freak slowly cuts back on the elements that just like hold the player's hand and force you to go through a ton of dialogue. Clumsy Ninja 23. By the way, that is a great screen name. Anyways, they ask, what's next for you after you've done every Pokemon in Generation 1? Well, I've sort of planned out roughly which videos I'm going to complete by the end of 2023, and even then I will not be finished Pokemon Yellow. So just finishing the first game in Generation 1 is going to take me till the end of likely 2024. However, I love Generation 1 so much, so I will be starting a Nuzlocke series for these games. I know that the later games are much better to Nuzlocke, but I really want to do Nuzlocke's in Generation 1 and 2. Also, I have plans to play Pokemon Red and to play Pokemon Blue. So in Pokemon Red, it's going to be a mirror of my Pokemon Yellow series so that we can compare the results. This series has actually already started on my channel, and the first video in it was Gengar vs. Gengar, where I compared how that one Pokemon compares between the two games. For Pokemon Blue, I'm going to play the game completely differently, so I'm not going to use any TMs. And uh, yeah, it is going to be a complete nightmare. <laughs> I don't know if that series is going to start by the end of 2023, but it will definitely start sometime in 2024 if I haven't already gotten to it. Of course, beyond Generation 1, I will be adding new games to the channel all the time, so hopefully at some point I will be able to regularly produce two videos a week. Otherwise, it is going to be more than a month before we see each game coming back to the channel, which personally I think is just way too long. Flying Skitty asks, Hey Scott, thanks for the amazing content. You are uh, very welcome. I know you've been coding stuff for the games you play, so I was wondering, what was your favorite quirk slash fun fact you learned about the game as you were coding stuff for them? Something like learning about Price's weird badge boost in Generation 2. Well, yes, Price's badge boost glitch is very weird, and I am so glad that I learned about that. If you're unaware of what happens there, if your special attack isn't over a certain threshold, then the badge boost to your special defense stat just doesn't happen. It is very annoying for a lot of Pokemon, especially because Red has five Pokemon which are special attackers. Because this is a Generation 3 remake video though, I should mention a interesting quirk that I learned about these games, and that's that all enemy Pokemon do not have fixed natures. Well, they sort of do, but not really. So when I was getting Otto, the developer of RBY XP Router, to generate me a giant JSON file of all of the enemy Pokemon's moves and stats, we ran into an interesting problem where we figured out that we couldn't find the natures for all of the Pokemon. So we had to determine how the game was figuring out which natures to assign to the Pokemon before we could know exactly what their stats were. It turns out that the game uses the trainer's internal ID, like their name, to figure out what natures their Pokemon should have. And that leads to a very weird quirk. 
because the rival is named by the player. You might worry that this means that the player can actually influence the rival's Pokemon stats, but that isn't the case. The developers thought around this and were like, we need to assign the rival a name. And you would expect them to give him the name like Blue or Gary, but no, they gave him the name Terry. I have no idea why. <laughs> Maybe it's a translation thing. Anyways, very weird. An interesting quirk here though is that it is likely that in different translations of the game that the trainer's Pokemon actually have different stats. I haven't confirmed that yet, so if someone else wants to confirm it for me, that would be absolutely great. Okay, final question of this section. J. Hank Ed Lion asks, As a musician, what are some of your favorite tracks from Pokemon? So my favorite track from a Pokemon game is definitely the champion theme from the first generation games. When I was a kid and I first heard this, I was just like, oh my gosh, it is so intense. This is definitely the final battle. The dissonant intro is just so good. And then the main melodic material that is featured at the very beginning of this theme is actually the retrograde of the rival's theme from earlier in the game. I didn't notice this until much later in life, but when it finally clicked, I was just like, wow, the composition of these tracks from the early games is just so good. So now we're on the SSN and I'm gonna take on the rival here. He really shouldn't be that hard because by this point, Mew is quite overleveled. I used Rock Tomb, it one-shots the Pidgeotto, so that was very easy. Next, he sends in War Turtle, but I have Bullet Seed, and I actually get a lucky five hit. It takes it all the way down to red health. War Turtle strikes back with Bite, which is super effective, but does very little, and then I finish it off on the next turn. In comes Chunky Raticate. I love this sprite. It's one of my favorites now. I use Mega Punch, knocks it out in a single hit, and then it's time for Kadabra. I was not sure if I should use Mega Punch or Thief, but in the end I went for Thief and it still gets the one hit. So that's it for the SSN. Just outside of Surge's gym, I teach Mew Dig, and now I'm ready for the electric type gym leader. He leads with Voltorb, Mew has great stats, so I move first, and I knock it out with one hit from Dig. Here I have a chance to learn the move Metronome, and no, I don't want to learn this move. I get asked a lot if I will ever do a Metronome-only playthrough, and I actually have a different idea. Anyways, Pikachu is next, I go for Dig against it, and I knock it out in one hit. Luckily, I gave Mew a Cherry Berry, so I heal Paralysis when it's inflicted by Static, and after that, I move on to Surge's Ace, Ride. I move first, dodging his Thunder Wave, hit with Dig, and knock the mouse out in a single hit. Alright, so that was another easy gym battle, and just before I get back to questions, I want to mention that right here after the wrapping last, there is the TM for Aerial Ace. Yes, I missed this in my Butterfree video, I really should have been using it. Anyways, now let's get back to questions. Autorly Lost 2029 asks, did your fiance convince you to get a cat yet? And not really, but we are fostering a cat currently, and it just arrived last night. So if you hear any noises in the background, like meowing sounds or uh, just things being destroyed, that's what's happening. <laughs> Eva White 1144 asks, who's my favorite starter of every generation? So let's go through them all. For generation one, it's Bulbasaur. For generation two, it's definitely Cyndaquil. Although when I first played generation two, I did choose Totodile. For generation three, it's definitely Trico. I chose Trico the first time I played the games and he's still my favorite. Generation four is undoubtedly Turtwig. I love that thing so much. I actually have a plushie of it. It is incredible. Now in generation five, my starter pick is probably gonna get a lot of hate. And that's because I often find myself drawn to Pokemon that get a lot of hate themselves. So in this generation, I always pick Taepig. And over the years, it has become my favorite Generation 5 starter. For Generation 6, Froakie's my favorite. In Generation 7, my favorite is Popplio. And then in Generation 8, my favorite is Sobble. So the modern era of Pokemon, I definitely like the water starters the most. However, the trend is broken in Generation 9 because I am totally a Fuecoco guy. That thing is awesome. It's so cool cute, and uh, Skeledurge is such a beast. Willow Rib asks, I'd love to know your first Pokemon related memory. Well, I was playing on the playground with a bunch of other kids. I must have been like six or something like that. And then I heard other children talking about Pokemon, but I had no idea about it at all. So I went up, I asked lots of questions. They had to describe everything to me because we didn't have any of the cards with us or any media. So it was like, yeah, there's this thing and it has like four arms and it's got a belt and like it's kind of got like a duck's face. <laughs> Anyways, I just remember being like, wow, this is like so interesting. I got to ask my mom about it. Not too 
too much longer after that. I went to one of my friend's birthday parties and as a part of the birthday party, he just brought his Game Boy out and we all watched him play. So that was my first experience seeing the games in real life. And uh, yeah, once I finally convinced my parents to get me Pokemon Yellow, uh, I've been hooked ever since. <laughs> Yeah, I love Pokemon a lot. Anyways, let's get back to the playthrough now because I want to mention something else in Rock Tunnel. And that's the fact that in the remakes, there is a move tutor here who will teach your Pokemon Rock Slide. Obviously, this replaces the Rock Slide TM, which you can obtain in the Generation 1 games. And today, I figured it made sense to teach Mew this move. After all, right now it has Rock Tomb, and I might as well upgrade. Next, I make it to Celadon City, and here there are not as many good TMs as there are in Generation 1. However, I can grab the T from this old lady, and then make my way to Saffron City. Here, I can get the TM for Psychic, and I teach it to Mew right away, because this is going to basically be my go-to move for the rest of the playthrough. Now in the remakes, there is no way to skip the Rocket Hideout, so I'm going to have to complete it today, and I'll take this time to answer a couple more questions. An unnamed user asks, what was the most painful head-to-head -head matchup that you've done? I don't know if I'd ever say that the Versus videos are painful to make, at least not the playthroughs themselves. The production process, on the other hand, is usually painful. It tends to be the case that because I have to film so much footage, by the time I'm done, our production techniques have evolved and then we have to patch so much stuff in post. However, if I really had to narrow it down, I would say that like emotionally the release of Alakazam vs Gengar was the most painful. There were so many tech problems. I had to re-release it like basically three times. It was like about to premiere. I had to take it down because I realized I had forgotten all the music. It's like, oh, it was a disaster. Um, in terms of play though, I think that maybe Machamp vs. Golem was one of the most painful because those two were so close together. Like, I remember when Golem finished its second playthrough and I just sat there in disbelief being like, I thought Machamp was supposed to be better. <laughs> like, why has Golem beat it twice? That was also the first video that I did multiple playthroughs in, so I wasn't prepared for the amount of work that went into it. And at the end of the whole process, because I did three playthroughs with each of them, I was definitely very exhausted. So for now, I'm going to stick with the answer of Golem vs Machamp. Leonardo Lewis 7487, I hope I said your name right, asks, what would you change in Pokemon Yellow to make the game more interesting to solo? He says that it could be to make it easier, harder, or my choice. So the first thing that I would have to find a way to change would be a way to make it slightly easier for electric types and poison types. Like Giovanni and the champion Sandslash just wall them like way too much. I'm not sure what the change would be here, but maybe it might be possible to balance things out a little bit better by making everything else harder. So if we take the approach of making the game harder for other types, then obviously adding good AI to Surge would be great because that would wall a lot of water and flying types early on in the game. I thought about ways to make Brock harder, like giving him a rock type move, but yeah, that would be just like way too much. Brock is already hard enough. I think another change would be switching up Erica's team just slightly. It is a little bit better in Pokemon Yellow now that I have more experience with Red and Blue, but if you gave her a Victory Bell instead of her Weepin Bell, she would be significantly more challenging to defeat. Also, just removing Bind and Constrict from the Tangela would make her way harder. Like, only allow it to use Vine Whip and Mega Drain. That would be, like, much harder. And it might make things a little bit easier for Poison types because then she's not going to hit them with Constrict and Bind and waste their time. Finally, I think that giving uh, Bruno good AI would probably be an excellent choice. After all, both of his Onyxes actually have good moves. Like, they have Rock Slide and Earthquake, but they never use them in the right situations. I know that this would make things harder on Electric types, but uh, Bruno is not known for his excellence anyways, so I don't really think that it would be too bad giving him more powerful moves. So now that we've covered most of the game, I think that I have figured out a solution for the champion. What if instead of a Sand Slash, he had a Pokemon like Dugtrio, and then we gave Giovanni the Sand Slash instead? That kind of centralizes all of the extreme ground type difficulty on Giovanni. And then Dugtrio is fast, but at least you can knock it out very quickly, whereas Sand Slash has way more bulk. And that tends to be the issue that electric types have, because they're fast, they can move first, they probably still would move first even against 
experience dug trio. After all, you have stat experience and the badge to boost your speed stat, and likely they would one-shot it because it has so low HP. All right, so those are my answers. I would definitely make Pokemon Yellow harder. It is already a very challenging game, but overall, I think that when there are more challenges in front of the Pokemon, it makes for more interesting solo runs. All right, so we've made it to Giovanni, and in this game, he is not going to be a challenge. Mew one-shots Onyx with Psychic. He sends in Kangaskhan next. I'm not able to one-shot it, but it just uses Tail Whip, and then I knock it out on the next turn. Well done, Giovanni. Last is his Rhyhorn, which is going to stay a Rhyhorn, by the way, because no, Giovanni does not get a ride on in this game. So that battle's out of the way. Now let's head over to Erica's gym. Now, because Mew is just shredding through the game, I am only going to fight the mandatory trainers in here. In Fire Red and Leaf Green, it appears that there are two. You have to fight this girl and then the regular trainer who has an execute. They're easy for Mew to defeat, and now it's time to take on Erica. She leads with Victory Bell. Mew moves first, hits a super effective Psychic, and knocks her lead out in one hit. Tangle is next. Now, I mentioned earlier that I think Erica is harder in yellow version, and that's specifically because Tangela is a much higher level. In these games, it's only level 24, so I'm just able to one-shot it with Psychic. After that, all that's left is Vileplume, and once again, Psychic one-shots. So there's one more fight that I want to deal with before we get back to questions, and that is the rival battle in Pokemon Tower. Now this fight is kind of interesting when comparing the three versions of Kanto that I'm currently playing on the channel. In Pokemon Yellow, he is so easy in this fight, and then in Red and Blue, he is a little bit harder, but like, not very much. He has a Gyarados after all. I think in Fire Red and Leaf Green, he's probably the most challenging, but still for Mew, no issue at all. I sweep through his team, and with that, let's get back to some questions. Bugpaw asks, have you ever considered shiny hunting? Also, what's your favorite shiny Pokemon? In the past, I actually did want to do a lot of shiny hunting, but I think my ADHD prevents me from doing it. I just get so bored and frustrated after a little while and then lose focus and just like do something else. I think that's why I really like solo challenges because it's not so long that I get tired doing it. Unless it's Magikarp, let's be real. That was way too long, but I had to play that over like two weeks. A regular solo challenge on four times speed usually takes somewhere between 45 minutes and five hours and that is a reasonable amount of time and it's also like this constant problem that I have to solve whereas shiny hunting is just a lot of monotony however the payoff I will admit is amazing funnily enough when you do solo challenges you don't actually fight a lot of wild Pokemon so I have never found a shiny Pokemon during a solo challenge the only one I've found was the shiny Rattata before I had Pokeballs in my Crystal Nuzlocke. To answer the second part of the question, which is what's my favorite shiny Pokemon, I don't really have an answer, but whenever the Pokemon becomes white or teal, I really love them. So for example, when Umbreon's stripes turn from yellow to like a like light blue, yeah, absolutely love that shiny. Bandit Rests asks, are there any runs that I want to do that are just too difficult or I can't justify doing for technical reasons, let's say? Well, quite honestly, I really want to start playing Pokemon Platinum. I think that playing the remakes is very fun, but it feels similar to Generation 1 because it's the same region. So this year I haven't started playing a new region yet, and because of that, I think that that's giving me this desire to play Generation 4. Also, when I was younger, I never played Generation 4, so I don't have a lot of nostalgia or knowledge about the games, so I think it's going to be really fun learning them, especially because of the physical special split. However, right now it's not possible because Retroarch and the DS emulator cores do not expose the RAM in a way that we can access with Gamehook. So likely we are going to have to patch Retroarch, then develop Gamehook so that it can access the DS games. And after that, we will have to decrypt the games in real time. Once all of those problems are solved, then I will have to develop my overlay for Generation 4. And finally, after all of that, I will be able to start playing Platinum. Anyways, if you have any knowledge about uh, developing Retroarch, those sort of things, please do reach out because these are problems that I would really like to solve at least before the end of the year. Okay, so now I'm going to answer two questions at once. Patel the assistant, by the way, uh, she makes Pokemon videos as well. She asks, are you planning to do another race like the Parasect one? And if so, which Pokemon would it be? The second related question by Red Eyes Solaris 1817 is, has the time taken to make the Parasect video going to affect Pokemon Solar Run contests in the future? Will the effort be too much to do it again? 
So to answer the first question, yes, I would really like to do more community videos. They are so much fun to do. However, the unfortunate thing with the Parasect video is that because of how much time it would have taken to finish it, I wouldn't have been able to get it done in one week, which is my release schedule. So I sort of just boxed the footage and haven't been working on it. And because of that, it just like constantly doesn't get worked on because it's such a huge task. For example, in that Parasect race, there is one playthrough by someone that is around 30 hours long. So <laughs> yeah, there's like a lot of footage to go through and pick moments from and stuff like that. Making matters worse, I announced the Parasect race before I finished the Porygon race. And then when I released the Porygon race, that was like one of the worst performing videos on my channel for the entire year. And it was the video that I put the most time into. So that has also been demotivating me on finishing the Parasect project because I'm just like, if I put like 400 hours into this and then it gets like 15,000 views, I'm going to be really sad. In the end, I think it's one of my main motivations to bring people together to play Pokemon and just share our love for these awesome games. So I do want to do more community events. And right now, the tentative plans or that I'll have at least one during the summer this year. However, the format's gonna be much different. It's gonna be that I announce the Pokemon we're playing on like say, a Sunday, and then by the next Sunday, you will have to submit your footage. And then by the next week, I will release the video. Anyways, I'll talk more about this when I finally do end up releasing the Parasect video. So back to the playthrough, now Mew is gonna have to defeat Koga. The thing is, in Fire Red and Leaf Green, his team is most similar to his team in Red and Blue, and uh, yeah, it's a complete pushover. Like, I guess he's a bit annoying here because his muck just refuses to go down to a single Psychic. By the way, at this point, I just want to mention how challenging Yellow version is. Like, in that game, his Venomoth is level 50. In this case, the max level on his team is 43, so... Yeah. With Koga out of the way, I now have to defeat Sylph, and this is going to take a little while, so let's answer a couple more questions. Mega Lazy Guy 123 asks, what Pokemon type do you feel is the fastest and the slowest when doing your runs? Well, first of all, we have to realize that this is very contextual. So each game is gonna have a fastest type and a slowest type. Also right now, if we look at my Pokemon Yellow tier list, it appears that poison type is sort of the fastest type. Like all of the S ranked Pokemon are poison types. So yeah, that's uh, surprising to say the least. Overall though, I think that a type like the Psychic type or the Water type is going to perform much better than most typings. However, in terms of the slowest type, I actually think it is going to be the Electric type, and that's just because of how awful Giovanni and the Champion Sandslash are, like I mentioned before. After I finish playing Pokemon Yellow with all 151 Pokemon, I will do a big analysis video, and we will answer this question definitively. Trappy Jenkins asks, What are three things you want to accomplish by this time next year? What advice would you give yourself? two years ago? Well, I'll start with the second part of the question first. The advice that I would give to myself is actually more reassurance. I would just want to convince myself that I don't have to stress out about stuff so much. Like, I would say, like, Pokemon is going to be your main source of income. You're going to play these games all day, every day. You're going to love it. Don't worry. Everything's going to be fine. Throughout the first year of making these videos, I was just terrified that all of a sudden every single viewer was going to stop watching the videos all at once. So I just pushed myself to like constantly improve everything and work with basically every waking hour to ensure that I was doing everything in my power to make that not happen. However, now when I look back on it, I think I could have taken things a little bit easier and just had a bit more fun. Like it would have been really enjoyable to start streaming earlier, but I didn't because I thought that the quality of my streams wouldn't be high enough. Like I was just worried that I wouldn't be able to fill the time in an engaging and entertaining way. So to answer the first part of the question, which is what three things do I want to have achieved by this time next year? Well, number one I've already mentioned, that is that I want to have a working overlay for Generation 4. There are so many tech problems to solve to make this happen, so I'm not sure if it's realistic, but I would really like it to be. The second thing is that I want to be confident enough in my play to do Versus videos in Emerald and Fire Red. And the third thing is that I want to hit certain targets for the number of videos that I'm going to release throughout the year. Now, if you watch my stream over on Twitch, you probably will have heard me talk about this at some point. I don't really want to officially announce the number of videos because it is very ambitious, but if I can hit these numbers, I will be so impressed with myself. Like, yeah, a year ago, I would have thought that this was completely impossible in any world. Okay, so it's that time we have to face the rival in Sylph. He leads with Pidgeot. I go for Rock Slide against it. Of 
course I miss and it hits me with wing attack. Luckily it doesn't do very much damage. My rock slide on the next turn takes it to yellow health. It hits me one more time and then I finish it off on the next turn. Next he sends in Blastoise because it has bite. So I guess I should use Psychic here. It does half. I get hit by bite which does very little. I just barely don't knock the Blastoise out on the next turn but then I do manage to take it out on the following turn. Now Mew has less than half health left over but I just have to go up against a Growlithe. Obviously Dig is super effective but nah just doesn't quite knock it out. I get burnt on the next turn and that's quite bad because Execute is next. I guess I still do have Thief and it's the best move right now. Okay it one shots so that's good. And then he sends in Alakazam, but the burn damage is just too much and Mew goes down. Alright, so the issue with that fight was definitely getting burnt. If I don't get burnt this time, I should be able to win. I make it through the Blastoise. This time I got better damage rolls, so I knocked it out in two hits. Growlithe is next. Because it hit me with an Intimidate, and because Psychic has the same type attack bonus, this is going to be more powerful than using Dig, so I just one-shot it this time. With that, I'm able to one-shot the Execute with Thief, and all that's left is Alakazam. I go for Thief against it. It doesn't quite knock it out, but the powerful Psychic type just uses Calm Mind, so I finish it off on the next turn. The nice thing about winning this fight is that now I get access to Lapras, which is going to be my Strength and Surf Mule, and it has a wonderful sprite. <laughs> Uh, it just looks so silly. Okay, so let's get back to questions now. Real Bayoga asks, what's your favorite fight to plan around so far? This can be across all generations that you've done. Just looking to see which major fight is the one that you always look forward to figuring out for the majority of Pokemon. Honestly, that's a pretty tough question to ask because of how the type system works. I think that overall the champion in Pokemon Yellow is the most interesting to plan around. The fact that his team actually has type diversity means that most Pokemon are going to struggle at some point. It's quite rare to go into that fight and just be like, nah, it's fine. I'm going to beat all of his Pokemon. There's no issues at all. Also, fights like Red and Steven seem like they'd be really challenging. And like Steven might be in the running for one of the most fun fights to solve. But Red definitely isn't. And that's because there's usually some mix of like Curse, Protect, and Return turn, maybe rest and sleep talk. Those moves pretty much solve that fight in most cases, which unfortunately is a bit disappointing. So the short answer definitely is the champion in Pokemon Yellow, but I do want to give one notable honorable mention, which is Brock, because Brock requires Pokemon to think sometimes really outside of the box, and moves that would otherwise be pretty useless like Sand Attack, Leer, Rage in one situation, those moves actually become useful. So yeah, I think Brock is actually a really interesting puzzle for most Pokemon to face. Matthew Brown 6573 asks, have you ever considered doing a speed run race between your fiance and editors? Honestly, I've never really thought of this idea. I have thought about doing races between like maybe my fiance and myself, but overall with the races, I would rather answer a question that is interesting for the audience rather than just like who is better at the game. Like can for instance we answer the question, is this Pokemon better in Pokemon Yellow or in Pokemon Red? That way I think we all learn something about the game and we build a sense of community and not like this like brutal sense of competition between each other or like extreme disappointment when someone's time is less than the other person's. If brutal competition is what you really want then stay tuned for the Parasect race, um yeah cause Things got very intense in that challenge. Mark Griffione 8826 asks, by the way, I probably got your last name wrong. I am very sorry. Anyways, he asks, do you feel like being a streamer has improved your life? And has it always been your dream slash ambition to become one? Well, I don't really consider myself a streamer. Like, yes, sometimes I do stream, but I really consider myself a content creator or a YouTuber. It was never my goal or my dream or my ambition to become a YouTuber. This just happened by accident. I actually wanted to become a streamer a long time ago when I was playing a lot of StarCraft 2. I streamed a little bit of that game, but honestly, I really didn't enjoy it because the streaming process was always so stressful. However, it's been really nice for me to discover this time around that I really enjoy streaming the Pokemon games. I think one of the reasons that it's less stressful is that when I'm streaming, I'm not facing other players. I'm just trying to outdo myself and get better results each time I do a repeated playthrough. So yes, in this case, I actually do think that streaming has improved my life. Right now, I'm pretty tired because December was so much work for me, and I find streaming a really fun way to just relax and talk about Pokemon in a little bit more informal way. After all, when I produce these videos, I am really meticulous about all of the details. 
Yes, we still do miss things, but I try to be as exact as possible. So in short, yes, streaming has definitely improved my life. I enjoy it a lot. I consider it more to be just for fun, and then producing the videos is my actual job. Phil K5456 asks, since you've been referencing Madrybred here and there in your videos, do you think that it's possible the both of you would collab for a video? Honestly, I do think that that's possible. I talked to him before about the idea, but our schedules never really worked out, so it didn't happen. I would love to do more collabs in general. Most Mostly the reason that I'm not doing more is that like time and energy do not permit it. After all, whenever you get more than one person working on a project creatively, it tends to be the case that things really slow down and require a lot more effort. Alright, so the rest of Sylph was very easy for Mew, but up next is Sabrina, and luckily on my moveset I still have Thief, and I did pick up the black glasses when I was in the rocket hideout, so I'm hoping this is going to give me an easy victory against her. I was a bit surprised when Kadabra came out of the Pokeball, I'm so used to her lead being Abra. I go for Thief, it takes her lead to red, and then she just uses Calm Mind and a Hyper Potion. My next Thief does half because of Calm Mind, and then I get one more attack in because she used a potion and that knocks the Kadabra out. Okay. Next is the flying psychic type, Venomoth. Now as is customary on this channel, I have to make a mistake against it, so I choose Rock Slide and it misses, so yeah. Venomoth supersonic misses, which is really lucky, but then I go for Rock Slide again. Luckily it does enough damage and it takes her moth out. Next is Mr. Mime, I go for Thief, it does more than half. Mr. Mime sets a barrier, which is absolutely useless because Thief is a special move. So I knock it out on the next turn and all that's left is Alkazam. I outspeed and hit Thief, which does more than half. Alakazam does very little to Mew with Psychic, after all I resist it, and then I finish it off on the next turn. Sabrina wasn't an issue for Mew at all. Okay, so it's time to head south to Cinnabar Island, and while I do so, I'm going to answer a few more questions. These are all from patron supporters, so thank you so much for leaving comments in my Discord channel. Insane Cucumber asks, What has been your favorite takeaway from your experience as a content creator? Honestly, I think it's the sense of community. Just having people around that I can talk to about Pokemon all the time is so much fun. If I had to pick a close Close follow-up, it's probably the fact that I get to learn so many new skills all the time. Like, I learned how to video edit, I had no idea how to do that when I started. I learned how to do audio production on vocals, and I am still learning that. I learned how to sound treat the room that I record my audio in, I figured out which microphones were good, so many more things. Like, I learned Photoshop and how to do editing, I learned Illustrator and how to do vector graphics, and of course most recently I've been learning to code and use JavaScript, and perhaps the least public skill that I am currently learning is how to manage teams and projects. It is very hard to coordinate all of this stuff and I have so much more respect for people who do project management now, so yeah anyways that's a skill I'm definitely working on right now. Kistulot asks, I really hope I pronounced that right, what move in Pokemon do you really want to like but wish was better in some relatively small way? How would you change it? So I really want the flying type moves to be better in generation one. Specifically, wing attack and fly, just giving wing attack a little bit more power, like maybe not 60 like it got in later generations, even like 45 or 50 would be nice. Also, I really like the improvement they made to fly in later generations, making it base 90 power, but I still think that's not quite enough. Maybe it should be like 100 power. After all, you're not doing anything on the first turn. Finally, of course, is sky attack. And I really wish they would just redesign this move and make it more similar to fly. Like on the first turn, you're invulnerable. On the second turn, you attack. It has low PP and low accuracy. That should be enough downsides. Of course, we could get into the moves that should be flying moves that aren't. Like Whirlwind. It should obviously do something in trainer battles in Generation 1. And then also Razor Wind. Like that move is just unusable. <laughs> Ah, uh, I don't even know what I would do, like, it's just so bad. Ah, uh, so, what were they thinking? Anyways, next question. Peep, who actually manages my credit sequence, asks, if you could choose one gym leader to remove with the goal of saving the most time from any of the games you've played on the channel, who do you think would give the biggest time save by not existing? Um, I think the answer is very obvious here. It is so clearly Brock. I would also like to remove Brock and then re-rank all of the Pokemon without the Brock split because some Pokemon like Gyarados would perform much better if Brock was just removed entirely. Lock Kirby 2 asks, after being a YouTuber for so long, how do you think you'd feel if you had to work a nine to five job? I'm not really sure. <laughs> I've never really worked a nine to five job. 
Like, I worked at Best Buy for a while doing shift work, and uh, yeah, I was like not cut out for it. I fell apart very quickly in terms of like physical and mental health. And after that, I'm very lucky that what I was doing in music allowed me to scrape together sort of like a gig based freelance job. So then I just did that for like five years. That was much better than working like a traditional nine to five job for me. And now that I'm doing this, it feels very similar, except the difference is, is that when I did the music work, I would get very tired after doing all the work. And now when I do Pokemon work, I'm just like so excited the entire time. So yeah, it's sort of like endless energy right now. So if I had to go back and work a nine to five job, I would uh, probably quit after a few months. Like, I don't know if I could do it, honestly. Crafty Mage asks, do you ever have intentions of rearranging, remixing any of the Pokemon themes for use in your videos? Honestly, yes. I have some cool music Pokemon crossovers that I really want to work on soon, but it's a little bit too soon to announce those projects. That's mostly because I just don't have time to do it yet, but I'm hoping that over the next six months, I will be able to start working on some of these projects and you will see them come to life. All right, so Mew has made it to Blaine. I do not expect this to be a hard fight. After all, his team is very similar to his team in Red and Blue. And in those games, he is just trash. I use Dig on the Growlithe. Like, yes, I really should be using Psychic here. Arcanine's next. I get hit by a second Intimidate, so now it really makes sense to use Psychic. I knock his ace out over two turns. Next is Ponyta, and I'm right back to using Dig. I have no idea what I was thinking. Yeah, either way, Blaine is bad, and I knock the Ponyta out, move on to the Rapidash. Luckily for me, it burns me, and that makes me use Psychic again. So I finish it off, and with that, I've earned myself the seventh badge. And with it comes a 10% boost to my special attack and my special defense. All right, so there's only one more gym leader left in the entire region. It is Giovanni in Viridian City. And there isn't very much intervening gameplay, so let's skip questions for now and just go right into that battle. Now, I do not expect this to be a hard fight. He leads with Rhyhorn, Psychic one-shots it, so that's perfect. Psychic one-shots the Doug Trio that follows. And then against the Nido Queen and the Nido King, I have super effective damage. I knocked the first one out. Mew has the chance to learn Ancient Power here. I really don't think that move's gonna be very useful. After all, I have Rock Slide, so I just say no. Move on to the Nidoking, one-shot it, and now it's time for Giovanni's Ace, the Rhyhorn Ace. So strange. Why didn't they give him a ride on? I just don't get this decision-making. Anyways, I finish it off in one hit, and with that, I have completed the gym challenge. All right, so it's time to face the rival before the league. Now, it's worth noting here that I could be using like Ice Beam or Thunderbolt to get more damage against the Pidgeot. It would also bypass the fact that Rock Slide has the chance to miss. Actually, thinking about it now, why isn't Rock Slide like a base 100 power move? After all, it has lower accuracy, whereas moves like Thunderbolt and Ice Beam have 100% accuracy and they have higher power. I don't know, it's a weird design choice. The reason that I'm not using those TMs is that they cost coins in the game corner. Now, I probably have enough money to just buy those coins at this point in the game, but I don't think that Mew is going to struggle with this fight, so backtracking to Celadon City and buying that TM is just going to waste extra time, and I might as well just sweep if I can. I make it past the Blastoise, Rhyhorn's next, I knock it out with a single Psychic, Growlithe time, finally I use Psychic against it to one hit, next is Execute, very unfortunately Thief doesn't one hit, so it does get to paralyze me. I guess it's nice I have Synchronize, so the Execute gets paralyzed too. I knock it out on the next turn, and now all that's left is the Alakazam. It goes for Disable, misses, Thief hits, doing half, and then it disables Thief, which prevents my next attack, so it's a bit annoying. Now at this point, I have minus three attack, and I think that Psychic is just going to hit harder, even though it's resisted. I go for it, it takes the Alakazam to red, it uses Psychic on the next turn, and then I finish it off. All right, so I've made it to the League, and here I will admit that I think I was a bit short-sighted. After all, Thunderbolt is going to be very useful against Lorelei, so I might as well backtrack to Celadon City now and purchase that TM. In this case, I don't have enough money to buy any of these TMs right now, so I'll just have to use Shockwave instead. So when I do more challenges in Fire Red, I'm going to have to think about buying these TMs earlier on. After all, they are great moves and they're going to help a lot. Now, I was streaming this playthrough, so my chat and I discussed which moveset might be best going into the League, and what we came up with is uh, pretty brilliant in my mind. I think it is gonna be absolutely incredible. So here's the moveset that I'm gonna go into the fight with Lorelei with. Psychic, Shockwave, Softboiled, and Calm Mind. Basically, this moveset is preventing me from losing at all costs. All right, so with that, I'm prepared. Let's do this. Lorelei's first, and she leads with Dugong. 
Here, I can set up Calm Mind. This boosts both my special attack and my special defense. Now, because Lorelei's Pokemon are special attackers, this is going to mean that Mew takes less and less damage as the fight progresses. Now, in Generation 3, if I get frozen, there is a chance that I defrost, so there's no way for me to, like, instantly lose this battle. I can use Soft Boil to regain health whenever I want, and once I've got plus 6, I use Shockwave and knock her lead out. Okay, so from here, I think I'm just going to sweep. I get a critical hit against the Lapras, taking it out in one hit. Bye bye Happy Sprite. Next is Cloyster. I use Shockwave on it, knocking it out in a single turn. The following Slowbro is also a one hit, and all that remains is Jinx. It doesn't go down to one Shockwave. It puts me to sleep, which is really annoying. But finally I wake up, get two Shockwaves in, and with that, Lorelei is no more. Okay, so it's uh, it's time for Bruno, and yes, he exists in these games. I don't think he's going to be very hard in this game. Actually, so much so that I didn't even heal going into this fight. I probably just forgot. <laughs> I always forget. Anyways, I have Soft Boiled, so I can just recover my health as I set up with Calm Mind. And then eventually I'm just going to sweep him with Psychic. Anyways, while I do that, he does have a lot of Pokemon after all. I should explain my held item, which is still the Black Glasses, and I have no Dark-type moves. So in Fire Red and Leaf Green, the held items are not nearly as accessible as they are in, say, the Johto games. So the only way to actually find a Twisted Spoon or a Magnet is to get them off of a wild Pokemon, and these are only a 5% chance to be held. So I didn't think it was worth wasting the time to pick up these held items. After all, I think that multiplying my attack stat with Calm Mind is going to be enough of a boost to give Mew the victory over the league. So up next is Agatha. She is much harder in Fire Red and Leaf Green than she is in Yellow, and that's specifically because all of her ghosts have Levitate. Luckily for me, Psychic is super effective, and I don't even think I need to set up here. I'm just gonna sweep. Yep, every single one of her Pokemon is a one hit. So with that, Mew is moving on to Lance. He leads with Gyarados, and here I'll mention that I am working on a trainer display for the right hand side of the screen so that we can see all the moves that his Pokemon have as well as their stats. It wasn't quite ready when I filmed this video, but I think by the time my next Fire Red and Leaf Green video releases on the channel it will be ready. To solve this problem I just asked my chat what his Gyarados has and doesn't have anything that I'm particularly scared against, so because of that I'll just set up Calm Mind completely, heal with Soft Boiled along the way, and when I get to plus 6 I use Shockwave, obviously 4 times damage and Gyarados goes down. Next is Aerodactyl. I use Psychic to knock it out in one hit. Psychic one hits the Dragonite, and after that he only has two Dragonairs left, so I easily sweep through both of them, and with that, Mew has made it to the champion without a single reset during the league. So the champion is definitely one of the hardest fights in the game, largely because his team actually has type diversity. Pidgeot's first. Now it's a physical attacker, so maybe I should knock it out right away. I go for Psychic because it does have a higher effective power than Shockwave. It does half, and then Pidgeot lowers my accuracy with Sand Attack. Uh, is that how I'm going to get my first reset? I really hope it isn't. My next Psychic hits, Pidgeot goes down, and next the champion sends in Arcanine. It intimidates Mew, which is fine because I only have special attacks, and then I decide to set up with Calm Mind. This is because the Arcanine seems to be prioritizing using Flamethrower. It does use Extreme Speed eventually, but it's not doing that much, so I can just heal with Soft Boiled. Oh. It looks like once I get above plus three, it decides like, yeah, that's too much setup. And then it just roars me out. So it's really annoying. By the way, my Doduo is named after a Twitch viewer. So thank you for checking out the stream. In these cases, I just require myself to switch in my solo Pokemon again. After all, I take some free damage and I lose all my setup. Unfortunately, for some reason, my overlay also lost the ability to show my stage modifiers after I was switched out. So that's kind of strange. <laughs> Anyways, I knock the Arcanine out after setting up once, move on to the Blastoise. I hit Shockwave. It does almost half. Blastoise uses Hydro Pump, which doesn't do that much. It recovers some some health with a citrus berry, and then because I'm not doing half, I decided to go for a single Calm Mind to just get a little bit more damage. Blastoise sets up Rain Dance, I go for Soft Boil to recover some health, he gets two more Hydro Pumps in, but this isn't enough, and my final Shock Wave knocks it out. Okay, so it's time for the Alkazam, and for some reason here, the effective power calculations are not working. I knocked the Psychic type out with two uses of Psychic. I think Shock Wave probably would have done a little bit more, but it still would have been a two hit. Next is Rhydon. I go for Psychic, it knocks it out in a single hit, and all that's left is the Executor. I have to use a move that is resisted here, either Psychic or Shockwave. I go for Psychic, and it knocks it out over two hits. So that's it. Mew has defeated the champion. After being added to the Hall of Fame, it clocks in with a time of 
1 hour 25 minutes and 3 seconds with 4 resets at level 57. This took 5 hours and 9 minutes of game time. Alright, I guess that one of my biggest fears about the remakes are not actually coming true. I was so scared that these games would take so long to beat, but an hour and 25 minutes for a mythical Pokemon is really good. These games are by no means as difficult or as long as Pokemon Emerald. I would say they're comparable in length to the Generation 2 games. I would say in terms of difficulty, Fire Red is probably harder than Red and Blue, but maybe a little bit easier than Yellow. After all, that game is really challenging. However, this isn't really the end of these games. There is a second attempt for the Elite Four after you defeat the entire Sevi Island plot. However, there's a little bit of a complication with timing this section of the game. Because in order to access these League rematches, you need to have caught at least 60 Pokemon in the Pokedex so that you can receive the National Pokedex from Professor Oak. If I did this and caught 60 Pokemon, it would involve so much luck that I wouldn't be able to compare the times between different Pokemon. So I think that the best way to do this is adding the League rematches as a bonus section at the end of the video. I can use like a software like PK Hex to hack in Pokemon in the Pokedex so that I can defeat the Sevi Islands in quick succession and then move on to these league rematches. So I'm going to finish off some final questions while I finish this post-game plot, and then we will come back and narrate the final rematches against the league. The Big Bean asks, do you prefer a Pokemon that has a difficult start and run, or do you like Pokemon that with some planning will crush the game? Honestly, I really like Pokemon that can just get through the game consistently. It really doesn't matter if their first run is difficult or not. For example, a Pokemon like Smeargle has just terrible stats and it's not very fast to defeat the game, but it is very consistent. A Pokemon like Seal, on the other hand, was not consistent at all, and while it got a decent time for Pokemon Yellow, it was so frustrating to use. I think another trend that I'm noticing is that with worse Pokemon, I'm not so focused on getting like the peak performance, so I make less concessions in terms of consistency, and they end up beating the game very consistently as a result. Whereas when I play with a Pokemon that's like Gengar, in order to get a time that I think really fits just how good Gengar should be, I end up having to like squeeze through at least one battle with some degree of luck. For that reason, I think it ends up being a little bit more rewarding to optimize a bad Pokemon than it is to optimize a Pokemon that's really good at the game. Jay asks, Hey Scott, I have ADHD like you. In my daily life, it's often really hard to get all the things done and keep up with my chores. As I know, producing high amounts of YouTube videos is quite a lot of work. How do you keep yourself motivated and focused even if you don't like working slash playing? Well, uh, the fact is that I really do like working and playing. This is sort of my hyperfixation or my special interest. So I don't actually find myself struggling with motivation. I struggle getting myself away from the computer doing other things. For example, uh, doing the dishes. It is my responsibility to do all the dishes. I absolutely hate it. And sometimes I just like don't do it because I'm like, well, I got to do another playthrough of Pokemon Yellow with like Hitmonchan or something. And it's like, but I've already done seven. Yes, this is the eighth one, but I really have to do it. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, it tends to be the case that like the chores don't get done for me. Um, and the YouTube channel does get done. So I guess that's good for all of us because we have more Pokemon content in the world. It is important for me to do my chores, of course. So I have lots of strategies. Like I like to leave post-it notes around the house on different items whenever I need to do something with it so that I get a visual reminder whenever I see it. I'm like, oh yeah, I need to do the laundry because there's a post-it note sticking on it. Yeah, anyways, that's my solution. It helps me out a lot. And then I also just tell myself like, it's gonna take two minutes to do this and it's gonna prevent like five minutes of work in the future, which would be like explaining why I didn't do the laundry or panicking when I don't have something to wear. And it's like, ah, I need to like find my like clothes. There's no clothes, where are they? And then I'm like wasting time doing that. So yeah, I found just reminding myself of that fact really helps with my motivation. All right, so this is going to be the last question. It's asked by Austin. He asks, if you were the final boss in Pokemon Emerald after Steven, what would your team be? That is a difficult question to answer because Steven is so strong and I just don't know if I could put together a better team than his. 
especially if I had to be centralized around a mono typing, and I think I would really want to be a bug type trainer. I'd have to have powerful Pokemon like Scissor, Heracross, and Pinsir, of course, but I just can't see myself having an in-game team without Butterfree and Venomoth as well. That leaves one more slot to fill, and perhaps Shedinja would be an interesting choice, because if you don't know how to play around it, it would be so frustrating to defeat. Alright, with all the questions out of the way, let's get into the game, and uh, I had to fight this rocket at the end of the Sevi Islands plot, and uh, he has a Houndoom, and unfortunately I am not not going to knock it out so yes Mew gets a reset here against a rocket which is so frustrating anyways I make it back to him and defeat him on my second attempt and with that out of the way I am ready to take on the members of the league again Lorelai's first and against her I'm going to use the same strategy that I used last time set up then sweep with shockwave and uh yeah she does have a pylo swine but I can just use psychic against it and knock it out so she was no threat at all Next is Bruno, and he gets a major upgrade because his Onyx have evolved into Steelix. So now they resist Psychic, which means they're going to take much less damage. Still, Mew is doing more than half to each of them, so I knock them out quickly, move on to his fighting types. And here, while I do one-shot the Hitmonlee and the Hitmonchan, when Machamp comes out, I don't get the one hit against it. Luckily, it can't do much to Mew, and I finish it off on the next turn. Okay, so it's time for Agatha. I sweep through the first three members of her team in a series of one hits, and then she sends in Mistrevis. That is very nice that the ghost type trainer has a mono ghost type. I finish it off in two hits, she sends in Arbok last, and I one hit it with Psychic. Okay, so it's time for Lance. Gyarados is first, and interestingly enough, in this fight, it has Thunder Wave, so it paralyzes Mew, and it also knows Earthquake, so while I'm trying to set up, it does so much damage, and in this case, because it's a higher level, it's actually moving first, it hits a second Earthquake and Mew goes down. So that is my first reset in the league so far. In the next fight, to avoid this awful situation against the Gyarados, I go for Shockwave right away and I just one-hit it. Next, Lance sends in Kingdra. It's pretty cool that he has this. I set up Calm Mind three times to improve my damage, and then I start the sweep. After that, the rest of his team is easy. So that's it. Now, while I do some inventory stuff here, I just really want you to note the fact that I have 12 rare candies. Yes, with Mew, I have beat all of the game to this point with only six resets, and I have used no rare candies. So we might as well find out if Mew can do this without using any of them. So, it's time for the final fight, let's do this. Heracross is first, I go for Psychic, it takes it to red health, and then it strikes back with Megahorn. Okay, in this case it misses, he uses a full restore, and that means I get two Psychics in a row to knock it out. Alakazam is next, and since it can't do very much to me, like yes it does have Shadow Ball, but Alakazam is not known for its physical attack, yes ghost moves are physical type in this game. So I'm just going to take my time, set up Calm Mind, and once I'm fully set up, then I'll start my sweep. Shockwave doesn't quite do half, that's a little bit less than I was hoping for, so I have to use Soft Boiled before hitting with another Shockwave. I decide to use one more Soft Boiled so I have good health moving into whatever his next Pokemon is. And in this case, it is a Tyranitar. By the way, why wasn't this thing given to more trainers? Like, this is the first time it appears on a trainer's team in all of the first three generations of Pokemon. Also, I guess I'm going to have to use Shockwave against it. It is really lucky that this thing is not a dark ground type, otherwise I would have no moves that could hit it. I do more than half, Tyranitar hits Earthquake taking Mew under half, but because I'm faster, I can finish it off on the next turn. Mew levels up to level 69, nice. Bot sends in Arcanine next, and here I decide to regain some health with Soft Boiled before I knock it out with a single use of Psychic. Executor is next, I go for Psychic, I don't really have something that's good against it, but I still knock it out in one turn. Alright, nice. Last is Blastoise, and of course, I can use Shockwave to get the one hit. So that's it, Mew has defeated all of the League rematches, and it did it without using any rare candies. I think I could really shave significant time off this playthrough by just using those earlier on to make a lot of the fights easier. Also, Brock really was one of the hardest challenges, so just knowing that I need around level 15 to face him would save some time. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed this video. Coming up next week is a playthrough of Pokemon Yellow with Oddish. It's going to be really fun. Also on Patreon, I am starting to release my exclusive Fire Red series. This is just a series where I'm like practicing and learning the game. I'm using evolutions, so it isn't the same series that I'm going to release here on the channel. If you want access to those videos, it's less than a cup of coffee. So uh, yeah, go check out the Patreon or click the join button on YouTube. Also, I just want to say a huge thanks to everyone who has already done this because we have over 400 people in the credits 
credits now. When I first started my Patreon, I never thought that we would even get the first 151 Pokemon, but yeah, now we're in the Sinnoh decks, so well done everyone. Like, subscribe, ring the Chimeco, and comment because I gotta read them all. If you've made it this far, you are incredible. I'll see you in my next video.